Welcome to um, the AUP HF Plus annual event. I'm suddenly that we roll off the tongue. Um, I, I'd like to start by saying something about the AUP HF Plus. <laughs> I'm Martin Herkham. I am president of the association, as it will henceforth be known. Um, and uh, we exist in order to um, advocate for French and Francophone studies uh, in the UK and Ireland. Um, so um, part of our work involves supporting um, conference and research activity from early career researchers, um, liaising with the uh, with colleagues in secondary sector and further education, um, as well as obviously with colleagues across higher education um, and promoting the study of um, French languages, uh, French language and French cultures and Francophone cultures. Um, and as part of what we do every year, we have a, an annual event and it's taken different formats, thanks mostly to COVID in recent years. Um, and this is the first, um, uh, well, the first hybrid event I think we've ever had for an annual event. We had, uh, obviously before the pandemic, it was always in person. Uh, then during the pandemic, it was always online. Um, and so today we brought them both together. So welcome to people who are in the room with us. Um, and welcome to those who uh, joined us online and who hopefully um, can hear us. Um, so um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our, our speaker today, um, Saskia buc -Fr. I decided I was going to say it the French way. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it seemed easier. Um, <laughs> um, who's a reader in diasporic and digital French studies at the University of Westminster. Her ethno-semiotic research focuses on questions of identity, belonging, and homemaking among London's French population in both online and offline contexts. She's been involved in several leading digital humanities projects and is curator of the London French Special Collection in the UK Web Archive British Library. Um, she is on the editorial board of the Digital Modern Languages section of Modern Languages Open and co-convenes the associated seminar series She's published in a wide range of journals and her first monograph, French London, a blended ethnography of migrant city was published by Manchester University Press in 2021. And we've invited her to, to give uh, the, the talk for this year's annual event, precisely because um, her work uh, highlights the way that the, the French language is embedded um, within UK society. Charles and I were talking about this not um, 10 minutes ago, uh, and uh, it dissolves the notion that there is such a thing as um, community languages, and then there are those canonical Western European languages, such as French, which have been studied in modern languages departments up and down the country uh, since the uh, 1930s, 1940s. Um, so um, it's a particular pleasure to, to welcome you here today, Saskia, and I'm going to hand over to you. Um, Saskia is going to talk for approximately 45 to 50 minutes, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Um, we are recording this session as, as well, um, and hopefully um, we will upload the recording to the ILCS uh, YouTube page and link it through to the AUPHF Plus pages eventually. Okay, so Saskia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you all for being here, whether in person or online. I know it's probably the worst timing we could have come up with, so extra thanks. Um, it's been a very long week for me, so hopefully I can read coherently. I will be reading. Um, so in the abstract for this talk, you'll have noticed my emphasis on French literature. And although the, writ the written word in French occupies a central position in my research, teaching and in my heart, this talk won't be focused on literature, so I hope I won't be disappointing anybody. Um, instead, I'll be exploring the in-betweenness of the French diasporic experience as materialized in the digital space, or what I call the diaspora space. Having painters as parents, the visual world has always been vying for my attention. From undergraduate research on the role of the object in the works of Sartre, Rogrier, and Q the Visual, Magritte, through my master's project on the in-betweenness of the translation space in the context of Algerian autobiographical literature, to my doctoral research on French Londoners' intimate life worlds in physical and digital settings, I've had a fascination not only for texts, but for everyday textualities and betweenness. 
These dual interests have naturally led me beyond French studies as traditionally construed to a fertile in-between space where disciplines, languages, methods, modes, and spaces merge. We could call this a transdisciplinary form of French studies, digital French studies perhaps, or digital transnational French studies. At any rate, I resist the French and Francophone studies coinage for the and acts as a border, reinforcing the binary and relegating non-hexagonal French identities and discourses to a distinct category, itself a subtle form of othering that tacitly reasserts imperial divides. This isn't a problem limited to French, of course. The same debates have been taking place in other languages, in languages as a whole, and in higher education as a sector. The rebranding of the Institute of Modern Languages Research, our generous hosts today, as the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies, and of the University Council for Mod of Modern Languages as simply the University Council for Languages, is testament to the problematic nuances of modernity as Joe Ford and Emmanuel Santos have reminded us, and of modernity's entanglement with the positivist discourse of those breakers of ground and blazers of trails in lands appropriated by force. Rather than modern languages, then, perhaps we should borrow the term from French, langue vivante, and reinvent our area of study under a new inclusive guise, living languages, to recognize that language and our research are fluid and open to change. It's this fluidity, this non-binary openness that a trans in-between prism enables. It not only allows us to read entre les lignes and entre the online offline divide, but to celebrate betweenness itself. Pragmatically speaking, at a time when languages and the humanities more broadly are being branded as, and I quote, low quality rip off Mickey Mouse courses by the UK Prime Minister, and when the critical skills developed by us linguists and humanists are deemed to pose a threat to the marketized degree machine that the UK higher education system is arguably becoming, a move towards transdisciplinarity and the digital humanities or digital French studies is not only natural but necessary. Similarly, at a time when much, if not most of our lives is spent online, can we justify not investigating these new digital cultural spaces? Without wishing to sound utopian, the internet has indeed given rise to the democratization of authorship. Beyond the noisy and often antagonistic world of social media, the advent of the World Wide Web meant anyone could disseminate their ideas, words, sounds, and images to an international audience free of charge via WordPress or other free blogging or self-publishing platforms. This has fundamentally challenged the notion of authorship and of publishing, archiving, and scholarly authorities upholding it. It also raises questions around what should and should not be considered worthy of intellectual inquiry and scholarly recognition. In some senses, we in languages have been ahead of the curve when it comes to bringing the digital into the academy. For decades, even pre-internet, a range of modes and media have been common features of the language learning space. And we were very early adopters of the internet in our teaching. However, in our discipline, digital media have tended to be used as a tool or channel rather than as cultural matter in their own right. The divide between so-called French language and content classes hasn't helped, as the symbolic capital of area, cultural or historical studies and a reliance on the literary canon and big C culture have served to obscure the value of cyberspace as cultural and linguistic substance. Given the current political climate, it's time we embraced Derrida's deconstructionism and challenged the binary between so-called language and content modules by bringing the internet into the French studies classroom as content. It's time we consider the digital not only as a mode of communication, but as material representation and as representative material. The internet is the stuff of our everyday, a fundamental texture of our lived experience, and our everyday lives give texture to these digital life worlds. Bringing the transnational online space, or the French diaspora space, 
under scholarly scrutiny will simultaneously give our discipline 21st century relevance and bring typically unheard, authentic migrant voices into the academic arena, hence providing a counter narrative to anti migrant mainstream media and political discourse. I therefore propose that we reach beyond hyphenated identities and disciplines, since the hyphen, like the and, is the typographical border, and instead embrace the blurry between spaces that Claire Taylor and Thea Pittman refer to as transness. Epistemologically, this takes the form of transdisciplinarity. Methodologically, it means exploring transmodal spaces. Culturally, it involves seeing beyond national divisions and investigating transnational diasporic spaces. Linguistically, it means transcending standard languages and code switching models and recognizing the, ri the rich lived reality of translanguaging. And ontolog ontologically, it means exploring the practices and outputs at the intersection of the online and offline, a fundamentally blended trans experiential space that now constitutes our everyday lived materiality, as this talk itself is demonstrating. <laughs> so we must embrace the paradox of the huge presence of the internet in contemporary life and its huge absence from French studies scholarship. This means moving towards a purposefully transdisciplinary diasporic digital French studies within an overarching framework of living languages. That applies a, a deconstructionist, queering lens to the false divisions between French and Francophone, even French and English, between online and offline, and between modes themselves. Concentrating on French migrant women's blogs in the UK web archive, hosted by the British Library, in today's talk, I'll demonstrate how a multimodal, trans-inclusive feminist conceptual lens is befitting of this reinvented French studies and of the betweenness of 21st century diasporic experience. But what is xenofeminism? You may well be wondering. Xenofeminism, or XF, is the brainchild of an international working group called Laboria Cubonics, a founding member of which, Helen Hester, defines XF as, quotes, an attempt to articulate a radical gender politics fit for an era of globality, complexity, and technology all of which are applicable to the French diaspora space. Hester also asserts that XF prioritizes materiality over information, and in so doing, it chimes with recent digital humanities scholarship on the intrinsic materiality and ambiguity of web archives as both sources and subjects of knowledge. As the term suggests, xenofeminism is a post-third wave feminism that explicitly embraces the xenos, Greek for stranger or foreigner. This makes XF an inclusive school of thought that rejects traditional outsider, insider, male, female binaries perpetuated by previous waves of feminism and instead fosters trans inclusivity and what Arjuna Pajurai terms as an ethics of hospitality. In the wake of Brexit and in the UK's continued hostile environment, nothing could be more apt but how does this relate to the materialities of the London French diaspora space? Well, when conducting my original field work among the French diaspora in London over a decade ago now, it occurred to me that these comparatively new and under-researched online textual spaces not only warranted analysis, but also preservation. Since the average lifespan of a web, web page is 75 to 100 days, I was concerned by how we could avoid a digital black hole in relation to the already, already relatively invisible online presence of London's French diaspora, or what William Bertomier provocatively defines as their non-histoire. Furthermore, in the context of a data deluge, where according to the UN, more information is produced every day than in the entire history of humanity. I asked myself how the online cultural heritage of the London French, which of course provides a window onto their lives, would be found in the future. We're therefore faced with a deficit surfeit paradox. On the one hand, web objects are incredibly fragile and prone to disappearance, either due to bloggers or website owners migrating to social media, for example, or because migrants move on geographically or socially. 
On the other hand, we're faced with an enormity of data in the UK web archive, which continuously crawls and collects millions of snapshots, snapshots of the entire .uk domain, resulting in approximately 900 terabytes of data, each terabyte being equal to around a trillion bytes or 1,000 gigabytes, and growing on a daily basis. The sheer vastness of the archive therefore serves as a barrier to access, not to mention the fact that much transnational web data is hosted by top-level domains outside the .uk domain, say in the .fr, .com or .org web spheres. So we're again presented with an abstract set of exclusionary dividing lines and diaspora space paradoxes. However, in Alison Phipps's Decolonizing Multilingualism, we're urged to embrace paradox. Likewise, cultural anthropologist Daniel Miller, in his monograph titled Stuff, emphasizes the paradox underpinning the book, positing that, and I quote, the best way to understand, convey, and appreciate our humanity is through attention to our fundamental materiality. But I wonder to what extent that is a paradox. Isn't materiality part and parcel of being human? Isn't it precisely our everyday use of objects and beyond that, our aesthetic and effective relationship to them that constitutes our very humanness and arguably distinguishes us from most other living creatures? Indeed, Alison Phipps writes that although her ethnographic project was grounded in multilingualism, in her field notes, it wasn't language that found its way into her notebooks, but quotes, rituals, clothing, food, objects, greetings and farewells, not meaning. This, it seems, is a far more meaningful paradox for scholars working in and with languages to address. I therefore argue that materiality is intrinsic to our everyday lived experience as humans and that it's not separate from language, but incorporated through language and language is itself the materialization of our inner worlds. Materiality is not just found in the obvious spaces and places of physical existence, but in the materiality of modes of expression themselves. As the linguist and semiotician Gunter Kress uh, maintained, in our digitally mediated contemporary world, the meaning-making potential of materiality is thus located in complex orchestrations of expressive modes online, be they in the written mode, in the images and photographs, in the lighting styles and angles within such shots, in the composition of text image ensembles on the web page, in the sound that may accompany them, even in the color of the background or the font style or size chosen. All channels for making meaning are modes. And however imperceptible, modes are semiotically charged, conveying the underlying motivations and interests of the sign maker. Furthermore, in a textual environment en ligne, which is inherently multimodal, these meaning-making affordances reside not in the modes alone, but entre les lignes, in the very relationships between modes and the productive betweenness of the diaspora space itself. So although the internet might at first sight be deemed immaterial in both senses of the term, that is not consisting of matter and not mattering, in today's hyphenated, hypermobile and hybrid online offline world, we can't afford not to explore it. Back in 2012 then, with these cultural understandings and heritage preservation aims in mind, I set about creating a corpus of web objects produced by the French diaspora living in London. The corpus, which you mentioned in the introduction, is known as the London French Special Collection, and it today comprises around 140 URLs, including official websites, individual web pages, and personal blogs, all linked by their London French diasporic identity and housed in the UK Web Archive, itself hosted by the British Library. Snapshots of the web artifacts are taken periodically for the life of the site meaning the collection is a living archive and one that can be studied over time to monitor change. In order to produce as representative a corpus as possible, which would meet the British Library's mission to, quotes, reflect the diversity of lives across the UK, 
I applied an ethno-semiotic theoretical model to the web curation process, drawing on Pierre Bourdieu's three-stage field analysis paradigm. I'll spare you the details, but in broad terms, this involved first contextualizing the field uh, in the field of study. Uh, for example, the French diaspora within the London field and within the field of power, for example, within the governing bodies, but also in the context of the uh, British Library and archiving institutions. Second, it involved ascertaining the relationships between different individual and or collective players in the fields, such as diasporic associations, schools, clubs, and so forth. And third, scrutinizing habitus in relation to field, that is individual characteristics and practices within the broader social environment. Practically speaking, it involved identifying and collecting web art artifacts that corresponded to each of the three diasporic field scales. So on the macro level, for example, you'll find the French Embassy, the Franco-British Council and the French Institute websites. On a meso level, the London Basque Society, for example, the Collège Français Bilingue de Londres and the London French Rugby Football Club. Uh, and on a micro level, you'll find individual artists' websites like the singer-songwriter Anne B and the visual artist Eleonore Pirinos. Uh, website alongside personal blogs such as Food for Thoughts, Lost in London or Tea Time in Wonderland. Recognizing the materiality of this special collection can itself be conceived of as a tangible corpus, um, a body of translingual diasporic material in the same way that the web archival body blurs or as Derrida famously wrote in Mal d'Archive, drawing on the double entendre of the word Trouble, um, it, it blurs the boundaries between the digital and physical, global and local, past and future. The diasporic collection is an intrinsically non-binary corpus. In metaphorical and metaphysical terms, it can be apprehended as a trans body in its own right, and one that destabilizes the, ling the linguistic and state borders erected by nationwide archives, which are defined and confined by the limits of their .uk or .fr country code domain. It shouldn't be forgotten that these domains are the byproduct of what the political sociologist Alison Phipps, not the French studies scholar I quoted before, um, calls a colonial and capitalist project where borders of class and nationality are at one with borders of gender to which we can add borders of language and the rise of English as a linguistic superpower. The translanguaging practices that typify diasporas and the web objects in diasporic web collections thus play an important role in redressing the gendered and raced balance of power in collecting institutions. As Lee Wei asserts, translanguaging repertoires go beyond hybridity and function instead as a third space. The multilingual diasporic corpora consequently helped to position the UK web archive in a progressive third space, transcending black, white, male, female, French, English binaries, and as such, queering and decolonizing the archive. Indeed, their presence epitomizes Michel Foucault's conceptualization of the archive in L'Archéologie du Savoir as a privileged space whose analysis fait éclater l'autre et le dehors, establishing that together, Nous sommes la différence. By incorporating French diasporic, uh, a French diasporic collection within the UK archival body, I hence aimed to actively counter the othering discourse dominating British politics and media, while at the same time realizing the unifying potential of an inclusive, non binary XF approach to difference. And with Google having just last year added 24 languages to their automated translation tool, uh, including 10 African languages such as Lingala and Twi, as well as minority Asian and South American languages like Quechua, whose translingual querying is in step with wider efforts to de-anglicize the web as one element of a necessary decolonial process. Similarly, by, to quote Terry Lee Thompson, presencing women, and recognizing the importance of what Caroline Tagg and Agnes Lyons refer to as women's translingual semiotic repertoires online and on the move, 
The blogs in this diasporic collection contribute constructively to Bonaki and Krizanska's notion of digital heritage activism. So now I've set the scene theoretically and methodologically, let's look at what this means in practice by turning our attention to a selection of blogs from the London French Special Collection. As you'll probably know, the word blog is itself a portmanteau of uh, the word web and log, and it's consequently an intrinsically in-between entity. Its logginess, like the journal intime of a pre-digital world, allows us to peek into the personal spaces of the bloggers, while its webbiness brings these private spaces to a global audience. Blogs are, therefore, the materialization of yet another public-private paradox. In the XF Manifesto, Laborio Cubonics assert that the task of engineering online platforms cannot ignore the cultural and semiotic mutations these platforms afford. Web archives, through their iterative crawling, that is, taking reg regular snapshots of URLs indefinitely, allow us to monitor these semiotic mutations within the same blog in ways the integrated blog archive wouldn't allow. Taking the Lost in London, Tea Time in London, and Londres Calling blogs as three examples and drawing on multimodal social semiotic thought, we'll see how over a relatively short period of time from 2009 to 2014 with a couple of slides looking more recently. Um, considerable semiotic reinventions are, are identifiable, some of which are obvious, others less so. These material changes will give us insights into the bloggers transforming identities and sense of belonging and home. We'll also see how translanguaging, given lasting material form in the archived blog, takes us beyond the realm of dualistic hybridity and code switching to an inherently trans idiom that makes its meaning through the embracing of multiple modes in the digital semiotic orchestration and transcends language per se. So in the earliest instance of the lost and found in London blog captured in 2010, so this is the first archive version, we observe that the blog name is in English, but the wording of the navigation menu is in French, page d'accueil. And à propos. The rest of the page is also firmly embedded in the French language and culture. From the formal post title, La devinette du mercredi numéro 14, to the cryptic wording of the post itself, je vous propose un c'est qui donc, French Lexis dominates. Beyond the language, however, the very idea of a Wednesday guess who, came, who game positions the blog post in a Franco-French context, one that is a remembered absent there, despite being represented in the present here-ness of the blog and the London space. It also recalls the spatio-temporality of childhood, since, as you know, Wednesdays are half days in French schools, and the mercredi après-midi thus provides scope for recreation. Likewise, the use of the c'est qui donc term, a phonetic misspelling of c'est qui donc, uh, derived from SMS shorthand, again situates the blog in a Franco-French context and suggests the target readers are also located in or are intimately familiar with such customs and codes. Even the typography could be considered a mode with meaning making potential beyond its initial purpose, given the culture specificity and intrinsic Frenchness of the punctuation marks. The hashtag for the number and the kind of triangular quotation marks. These suggest this suggests the blogger's cultural transformation has not yet begun in earnest. The blogger's linguistic and typographical practices position the blog body in a pre-migration space and mindset or primary habitus, to use Bourdieu's terminology. And this pre-migration situatedness is reinforced transmodally through the banner image. Although it locates the blog in a between space through its depiction of London framed by French words, it's nevertheless a stereotypical photographic representation of the city, its identity depicted through iconic London landmarks, Big Ben, the London Eye, and a red double-decker. 
The 2009 and 2010 captures of the Tea Time in Wonderland and Londres Calling blogs are equally rooted in the pre-migration context with equivalent iconic representations of London. The language is predominantly in French, despite some playful and thus contrived or motivated, to use Cress's term, translanguaging in the blog names and blog post titles. Eat cake and carry on, for example, and say cheese, respectively. Whereas the name of the tea time in Wonderland is exclusively in English, it's nevertheless an English replete with pre-migration French stereotypical resonance, as exemplified through the outdated trope of the English as a nation of four o'clock tea and cake takers, and through the nod to the world-famous Lewis Carroll classic Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, when le tea time was indeed at its height. The Londres Calling blog name is by comparison a far more complex trans entity, but one still based on a cliche of Londonness, albeit a more recent one of a different kind. Playing on the infamous song London Calling by British punk band The Clash, it's evocative of the popular youth culture that so appeals to French youngsters and informs their pre-migration imaginings of the city which is why Camden Town is placed squarely on the French tourist trail. One of my interviewees confirmed this, declaring that ici, il y a cette idée de liberté. On voit des punks, on voit des gens avec des cheveux bleus, on peut se mettre des robes courtes avec des Doc Martins, et puis six mois après, on, on sera habillé complètement différemment et il n'y a pas de problème. Ça, en France, ça se fait pas tellement, en fait. On juge beaucoup les gens sur leur apparence. But beyond this, quotes Cool Britannia, a uh, connotation of the blog name, Londres Calling also speaks of radio transmissions to Europe during the Second World War, when the BBC broadcasts began with the now legendary words London Calling, or in the case of broadcasts from General de Gaulle, Ici Londres, which is today the title of a monthly magazine for French Londoners. Consequently, the blog title merges languages, broadcasts, and historic and cultural temporalities and references. And its present incarnation, and in its present incarnation, it embodies the blogger's relationship with her blog visitors. Symbolically, she is the free French Londoner communicating with her compatriots left behind. So through the Londres Calling blog name alone, we note a creative crossing of spatial, temporal, national, cultural, and language frontiers. However, at this early point in the bloggers' migration journeys, the English words used are those that already inhabit the Franco-French collective consciousness, like the physical world of the images that work semiotically and transmodally with them, whether St. Paul's Cathedral here, um, the London bus of the Lost in London blog banner photograph we saw before, or the mythical Gilbert uh, K2 telephone booths, which compounds the Londres calling uh, title uh, and signification of that title. So this interlingual practice is to a certain extent manufactured. As you know, say cheese, for example, is commonly used by French families in the same photograph posing manner as in Anglophone context, irrespective of any prior personal or professional connections with the UK. At this stage, then, the translanguaging materialized um, in the blog is less intricate, less spontaneous, and less revealing of a transmuted London French identity than in later archive versions of the blog bodies. And London is still depicted from an outsider's perspective. It's not quite home yet. Fast forwarding a year to 2011, in this capture we can see, um, and it's the same blog, it's the same URL, but you can see how the banner has transformed from the touristic certificat de présence in the words of Roland Barthes to a more culturally complex semiotic orchestration. In addition to the background map of London situating um, situating the blogger geographically and the blog, the Chubb Key is also profoundly characteristic of quotidian life in Britain, pre-reflexively conveying the threshold of a material home in the local London space. Jeremiah Chubb, 
patented the detector lock in 1818, and the keys remain an integral component of many Londoners' material lived experience, an element of what Jennifer Rousel terms their fractal habitus. The corner of the TFL oyster card seen edging into the frame is semiotically comparable. It serves as an indexical signifier of the everyday logistics of London residency, accentuated transmodally by the blog's growing navigation menu, which now includes carnet d'adresse, Londres mode d'emploi, and que faire à Londres buttons. The pink elephant is also a meaningful artifact, pointing to the elephant parade that took place uh, in London streets in the summer preceding the post, and again, underlining the blogger's spatial, temporal, and cultural, and arguably ethical positioning, since the elephants were part of an awareness and fundraising conservation campaign. Although this increased geographical scope and embeddedness, textual and visual, bears witness to the blogger's growing emplacement in London, the ballpoint pen, on the other hand, transports us back to the French space. While the English word biro is testable to the pen's original inventor, the Hungarian-born journalist Laszlo Biro, who later migrated to Argentina and the USA together with his pen, it's the adapted and improved Bic ballpoint pen patented by French entrepreneur Marcel Bic, B-I-C-H, himself an Italian-born migrant, after whom the pen is named, which has monopolized the sector and the collective French imagination. Having sponsored major national events like the Tour de France and launched omnipresent advertising campaigns in France and the French-speaking world from the 1950s onwards, the BIC brand is synonymous with French writing and schooling practices, with the translation of the everyday noun biro obviously being un BIC in French. Indeed, only last week when I was in Tunisia for a British Academy funded international writing workshop, the ubiquity of the BIC in the francophone sociocultural space was yet again evidenced as seen in this roadside poster. There's not time to go into the post-colonial resonance of this image, but suffice to say the everyday objects furnishing the blog are infused with transnational and transcultural meaning and are indicative of the blogger's cultural identity transitioning, positioned between the French and London spaces with a strong dynamic between offline and online worlds. Moving forward to 2012 and 2014 captures of the three blogs, uh, further semiotic transmutations are noticeable. There are again significant changes to the blog banners and a shared reliance on non-photographic now, graphic novel type visuals consistent with the blogging practices of the London French community more widely. This intertextual connectivity feeds into a broader trans blog meaning making and memory making process can be conceivable as a means of preaxial community building. As Apadurai posits, and I quote, the migrant archive is a continuous and conscious work of the imagination, seeking in collective memory an ethical basis for the sustainable reproduction of cultural identities in the new society. The common pictographic identity of the blogs, therefore, works on multiple semiotic levels simultaneously. The figurative Londonness and formal Frenchness continue to situate the blogs in a fertile cultural between space. Meanwhile, the agentive reproduction, reproduction and circulation of um, shared stylistic resources allow the bloggers, in the words of Carmel Weissman, to use blogs not only as texts, but as avatars performing identities through blog iconography and signaling group identity and subcultural affiliations through engagement with specific blog design styles. So the graphic novel style banners testify to an evolving habitus among all three bloggers. They're no longer outsiders looking in on London from a stereotypical touristic point of view. They're becoming insiders, more culturally attuned to local practices and places, yet representing a remembered French cultural space where la bande dessinée is celebrated as the ninth art. At the same time, this shared reliance on graphic imagery connects the bloggers to the London French diaspora space 
through the common in-betweenness and culturally sensitized and locally emplaced reference. Indeed, if we compare the Londres calling Lost in London and Tea Time in Wonderland blogs with other blogs in the collection, similar phenomena can be evidenced. For example, the transformation of the Apéro blog London from a stereotypical-ish photograph to a culturally trans graphic orchestration. In the 2012 iteration, the font speaks of remembered cursive handwriting à la française, but the disproportionately large pint of lager is firmly located in the post-migration culture and recalls the excessive local drinking habits described by my interviewees, <laughs> one of whom declared that Londres est un apéro géant. <laughs> the materiality of the blog again merges pre- and post-migration, past and present habits and habitats in a similar way that the teapot and the seat in the 2014 version of the Tea Time in Wonderland banner does. Here, while the depiction of the quintessentially British tea time habits through fractal elements from the local habitat suggests local belonging and a sense of being at home, significantly the shape of the teapot is more reminiscent of a French coffee pot and the chair is not a traditional English wheelback or Chesterfield wing chair, but a Louis XV armchair. The everyday textures of the blogs are therefore undergoing processes of cultural transmutation that mirror the translocal emplacement of the bloggers, habituated to local practices, but not entirely belonging yet. We could then refer to this as an in-between home, positioned at the intersection of pre- and post-migration spaces and identities. Returning to the 2014 capture of the Londres Calling blog, in addition to the fractal habitus transformations conveyed semiotically through the blog as a multimodal ensemble, we also note a fluid seeping between languages and mixing of linguistic identities to produce and reproduce from one blog to the next within the London French blogosphere, a new trans London English French body. The navigation menu buttons now merge French and English, à propos having transitioned to about and an FAQ uh, option having emerged. Perhaps more indicative of the creative potential of the bloggers like translanguaging is the title of the 2012 blog post, Alfie's Antique Market des Puces et un Rooftop. The French and English um, as well as the online and offline, are in conversation with each other. The reference to Pousse speaks of French flea markets, whereas Rooftop alludes to the palatial lived experience of the London market and the blogger's immersion in the English language. So we see how the predominance of monolingual French language in the earlier captures has now transformed into a translingual body taking pride in its transcultural and transplacial identity. This is demonstrated yet more compellingly in a 2017 archived instance of the Lost in London blog body. In a post about venturing to Tooting to sample the gastronomic delights of a French restaurant called Bordelais, the blogger writes, Y retourner si j'étais lo local, as we say around here, certainement, et sûrement pour tester leur French Sunday roast. <laughs> Here, we note the increasing transness of the bloggers' cultural ling linguistic positioning. Comparable to the language used on social networking sites, this, in the words of Caroline Tagg and Philip Sargent, sits somewhere between personal conversation and public broadcasts. It hence recalls the betweenness of the private public weblog genre slash gender and the archive more generally. Despite being for public consumption, the colloquial tenor of the utterance is perceptible through the rhetorical question and its inner conversation quality. However, yet more striking is the spontaneous intermingling of French and English that effortlessly embodies London French interactions offline. We note the transition from French to English within the same sentence in accordance, it would appear, with the blogger's stream of consciousness. It seems the English term local has been used almost pre-reflexively for its economy of effort, constituting a concept that would require more words in French, yet its use triggers a subsequent thought process in idiomatic spoken sounding English, as we say around here. 
The unthinking character of this translanguaging is underlined by the absence of quotation marks, unlike local, which significantly now has English rather than the French version of the inverted commas noted earlier. The blog then reverts to French momentarily before concluding in English with French Sunday roast. Teste, on the other hand, is positioned somewhere between the two languages and at a translingually pivotal point in the utterance. As Li Wei asserts, such fluid translanguaging goes beyond code switching, primarily because, as we've seen, it's part of a wider multimodal body, but also because of the simultaneous merging of cultures and blurring of place. The Sunday roast, as cultural ritual and object of consumption, is profoundly entrenched in British homemaking and social dining practices. So to preface, preface it with French is arguably a transgressively queering act. The simultaneous presence of eight English words and nine French, together with one in between them, melded in a single three sentence utterance is equally trans inclusive in a figura figurative sense, of course. So we're now a long way from the contrived interlingual playfulness brought to bear in the early incarnations of the blogs, the say cheese examples, et cetera, and closer to an intrinsically trans body that blends, blurs and trouble linguistic, national and cultural divides. Even the blogger's reference to local, i.e. tooting, transcends the network translocalism described by Yanis Andrutsopoulos and the binary conception of culture alluded to by Daniel Miller. True to XF objectives, the localism evoked by the blogger isn't a generic London French one entangled with problematic boundary building notions of wealthy white South Kensington community, but a more emplaced localism that through the insider's gaze is capable of distinguishing between socio-culturally nuanced and highly situated places. So we're now dealing with a French Londoner whose insider knowledge is suggestive of full belonging in the local space, which is now home to the extent that gritty tooting, a far cry from South Ken or Camden, brings a level of urban authenticity to the blog in a similar way that the spontaneous fusing of languages is true to the everyday transness of French Londoner's speech. In the blogger's hyper-localized quotes, thinking beyond the class London French micro community. And in my own efforts to depart from the essentializing construction of English as a global lingua franca, favoring inclusivity and by extension, diametrically opposed to other languages, which function as a strategy for addressing a particular language community in the words of Tag and Sargent, we witness a rational performativity of an XF agenda. Granted, such organic translanguaging will speak to French residents in London more clearly than French stayers, but it will not necessarily resonate with members of the established French community, whose continued, some might say, communitarian reliance on French was demonstrated by one of my interviewees. She'd moved to South Ken with her family, where she explained, um, on voit plus... Uh, on voit plus d'anglais, on ne parle plus anglais. Je pense qu'on aurait pu repartir d'ici sans parler anglais. C'est vraiment terrible. Furthermore, this translingual diasporic presence in the Anglophone UK web archive actively breaks with the policy of other collections in the British Library, such as its sound archives or history repository, whose criteria for, for deposit require that the vast majority of the material is in English. Rather than an expression of exclusivity communautaire, therefore, the blogger's translanguaging is an incarnation of inclusivity. Beyond the splitting and othering, implicitly inscribed by notions of community and culture, and consequently by the hybridity construct, based on binaries of quotes, quoting a Pedroi, sameness and difference, and reliant on what Floyer Anthias defines as the residual elements of essentialization and culturalism, the blog embodies an inoculating transfusion of languages, modes, cultures, spatialities, and temporalities that together queer the corpus, the so-called community, and the archive itself. Owing to the evolving technical affordances of blog platforms, more recent captures are less obviously translinguistically uh, are less obviously linguistically trans entities. 
captures from 2018 and 2019 reveal a predominance of visual meaning making, whereby the Londres calling land, landing page has been reinvented as a 12 part image grid. Uh, almost devoid of written text. Similarly, the Lost in London and Tea Time in Wonderland homepages now present full screen auto-rotating auto photographs. All three sites provide the blog visitor with greater navigational agency, but in so doing, they fundamentally retransform the diaspora space. There are remnants of the blog's previous incarnations, such as the distinctive red fonts used in the Londres calling, um, site or the enticing French word of lost in London subtitle, but a priori, their metaphorically trans identity seems somewhat compromised by these new technologically and commercially motivated orchestrations. Conversely, from an XF perspective, the, the blogger's manipulation of the tech to repurpose the original web blog diary form more patently than in the earlier uh, trans than in the earlier one, date-based presentation of posts could be regarded as an articulation of growing trans-feminist ideologies. Equally telling, as regards the migrant sense of belonging and positioning in post-Brexit London, is that the lost and found in london.wordpress.com URL, which was the one I had um, harvested in the London French Special Collection, has itself migrated to lost in London. .fr. This arguably regressive establishment of nation-based online top-level domain bordering thus mirrors the increasingly divided nativist populism fracturing the transcultural, transnational European body at the time, and by extension, the UK web archive. The post is dated May 2017, so in the midst of the Brexit fallout. For the .fr reincarnation of the blog has since become excluded from the open access London French special collection. To conclude then, um, through my analysis of these archived blogs, I hope to have shown how their everyday materiality from keys, biros and pink elephants to oysters and teapots down to the ostensibly most insignificant typographical detail offers meaningful semiotic insights into cultural positioning and identity transformation over time. Reading between the lines and between modes, I've teased out meaning from the between space of French migrant women's blogs, showing how their spatiotemporal, cultural and linguistic betweenness dovetails with, to quote Helen Hester, a xenofeminist politics of technology. Redesigning their blogs to their own expressive and entrepreneurial ends, the bloggers were seen to disrupt established generic and linguistic structures. Their increasingly spontaneous translanguaging went against the grain of standardized monolingualism, itself a relic of empire, white male supremacy and heteronormativity. Similarly, the women's agentive reinvention of the blogs to showcase their photographic prowess demonstrated their alignment with XF repurposing tenets. Equally importantly, I hope to have offered a glimpse of the scope and relevance of these digital art, art, artifacts as new objects of study in their own right, offering new forms of literature and requiring new types of literacy, ripe for use by researchers and students in our field. Through this keynote address, which has drawn attention to online, offline, here, there, past, present, visual, written, public, private, and national, local dynamics, I therefore hope to have demonstrated how the French diaspora space is a positively deconstructive one, transcending geographical and disciplinary dividing lines. I've challenged the artificial boundaries that continue to compartmentalize subject areas, languages, cultures, and the web, and attempted to meet my, to quote Donna Haraway, response ability to actively to contribute to an intersectional decolonial effort. I didn't have time to fully develop the XF framework today, but given the relevance of xenofeminist work to our increasingly divided and xenophobic times, I also hope to have made a small contribution to XF's collective ethical mission. 
And if you'd like to know more about my work, here's a shameless plug for my book with a 40% uh, discount code. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, Thank you, Saskia. I mean, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I think, you know, if you just presented all the material on the blogs alone, that would have been, you know, really, really interesting. But I think you actually, you've got much beyond that and he's thrown down a challenge um, to um, French, francophone studies and, and I think there must be a whole ton of questions. I've got at least three but I'm going to be polite and I'm going to let other people ask questions. I'm also going to move over to my laptop okay. so that I can um, keep an eye on people on their uh, call in case they've got questions as well. So, um, I'll open it up to the room while I figure out how to <laughs> So if you're online and you've got a question, then um, please raise your hand. Um, I guess the first one is. Um, so, 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 so start with the small one. Start with the small one. <laughs> um, um, I just want you talk very briefly about uh, sort of two, almost like two um, French speaking communities in London. The, the ones who say, you know, they only ever hear French. Yeah. And then those people working with trans language. Have you done any research about the, what distinguishes those two groups? Any sort of work? work around um, what distinguishes them demographically, in terms of age, gender, experiences, or uh, you could elaborate. Yeah, I mean, it kind of, it featured quite prominently in all of my research, my kind of qualitative, what I call on land research. And one of the questions I would ask people was whether they felt they were members of the French community in London. And nearly all of them, with two exceptions, said no, they, they didn't. They acknowledged that a French community existed, but that community was based in South Kensington. They were, as I mentioned, white, wealthy, and a community that most of my interviewees didn't identify with at all. In fact, a lot of them said they never even go to the French Institute or the French cinema. For them, there's a real kind of social class divide which seems to have been transported with them from the French pre-migration space to the post-migration space which was quite interesting. Yes. Um, having said that I think other kind of micro communities do build up often around schools mm -hmm. so um, there's definitely one in kind of the Clapham area which is a bit more diverse than what people including the French think of the, as the French community um, and also you know in northwest London there's a two two other kind of official French uh, state-funded secondary schools. So we see these kind of burgeoning communities developing around schools and even Saturday schools, like there's one in Blackheath um, where as a consequence, uh, lots of people kind of live around that Southeast area. So yeah, there are lots of different hubs, but um, yeah, there was definitely a divide that, that, that most of my interviewees mm -hmm. sensed. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that um, doesn't surprise me. Before I give you my other questions, I'll ask you if you want to. That's fine. The question about kind of terminology and self definition, I found it absolutely fascinating to moderate. I want to know if everyone loves it, she's in the self. In relation to like the word diaspora um, yeah. and how um, that's kind of a word that like, causes very much of this when you studies the Jewish studies. And I was wondering in terms of style definition, because we talk about French community as well as French diaspora, we talk about saw some mention of like expat or so migrant. And um, I guess in relation to that, you just touched on obviously your response um, to the first question. Um, 
where this kind of intersectionality can come in, not just in relation to um, race, class, and gender, but also religion, and also multilingualism, and having both Arabic as well as French. Based on yeah, there's lots of questions, <laughs> but all really, really important and relevant questions and, and questions I've, I've struggled to, you know, previously come up with a easy and distinct answer to. Um, I guess I'm leaning towards diaspora now because of the term community being so loaded, especially in the French context. Um, you know, community tends to have slightly positive connotations, I think, in the British context, whereas in France, it's it's very negatively loaded politically. You know, when it's to, people talk about community, it's often the far right and they're talking in derogative terms about different um, ethnic and religious minorities. So, um, yeah, and also because of this distinction that my interviewees drew attention to about not feeling that they belong to that community. And um, so to, to kind of move away from that, I'm moving towards diaspora. Um, but it's not necessarily the ideal term either. Um, expats, again, this was another question that we discussed in my interviews in terms of self-identifying. How do you see yourself? Um most of them didn't see themselves as expats because for them that meant they were kind of sent by a company somewhere um, and it had kind of post-colonial resonance for them. So I tend not to use expats. In, in my own writing, I, I refer to migrants, although that's not a term a lot of them identified with. A few, a few did. Um, so, yeah, there's, it's, it's difficult to come up with a straight answer to that. But I think there are certainly lots of, uh, I'm, I'm going to say sub-communities, but it's probably not the best term, within the French diaspora. And, and that's kind of where my new research is, is going. Um, I'm putting together a funding bid with um, a couple of other colleagues, Nadia Kiwan, who may or may not be here, um, looking at the role of laïcité potentially in migration and how there are, because I discovered this in my research, that there are kind of French Muslim groups who live in London precisely because of that religious freedom that they have here. But they're also French um, Jews, too, and French Christians. So, yeah, we're going to be looking at kind of laïcité as an uh, aggressive uh, push factor, if you like, for migration. So, yeah, it's an important question, but I don't have an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> interesting I haven't really found any or looked into it yet what I found when I was creating the um the collection for the British Library that it kind of made itself because one blog would be hyperlinked to another blog which would be hyperlinked to another blog so there was this kind of community identity between the blogs themselves but that may be a little bit exclusive, in fact. So perhaps I should do some more digging and see what I can find, which isn't directly related to the French. I mean, we've got a few which are like the, the Basque one. Um, I reached out to them and there was a lot of Spanish on that one. So I wasn't sure whether they would want to be included in the French collection and they were really keen to be included. So, so they're there, but that's untypical. The others, there's a lot more coherence between the others, between the different um, blogs. Uh, but yeah, that's something to, for me to, well, in fact, that's part of my project that I'm putting together. We want to look at the online and offline uh, representations. So yes, I will do that. <laughs> yes. Thank you, that was fascinating. And um, I just want to add one thing, sorry, I'm struggling a bit to formulate uh, the question on this issue, and that is something, the question around disciplinarity. Um, certainly, uh, an idea of discipline 
gives a certain status and seriousness to a type of study that I think, generally speaking, we would consider um, disciplines uh, to be in some way limiting, and um, they can have all sorts of uh, colonial nationalistic connotations. Um, so, from your talk, you're talking really as a bit idea of disciplinarity as a sense of a, a, a series of operations that have their own history and their own um, context, but they make sense only if they're in dialogue with other sets of operations and involved in a very plural and evolving um, set of, of questions. So, in, in, what you're arguing for um, is, is the idea of the existence of disciplines, but nevertheless, their contingency and their plurality. Um, but this is difficult in a way, but this is difficulties for uh, universities, disciplinary structures, it's also difficult for the individual who has to become more aware of the operation of the intersection uh, and the way in which uh, disciplines come together. And that plays on GCSE, it plays upon the university structures, it plays. So um, absolutely, I, I think this is this is a ground that needs to be on, but it's difficult ground to be on. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Um, it's not easy for me as an individual doing kind of transdisciplinary research because I kind of often, I feel at home here actually, but I often feel like an imposter when I'm at the more digital humanities type events. Um, but even, I, do I feel at home? I only feel half at home here probably because often when I look up French studies, you know, communications, it's, it's, it's a, it will be about a topic that I find interesting and then it will be in relation to, you know, literature, which, which is great, but, but there are other things that we could be looking at now. So, yeah, the more that we can bring the disciplines together, the better from my perspective, because maybe I would feel at home somewhere, but, um, but I appreciate it is difficult and, you know, people argue for, transdisciplinarity and the public funders encourage us to do interdisciplinary work now but then when you actually put it into practice you have to submit you know to a certain funder and then you have to choose which disciplines your work fits under so I end up having a long list and it looks completely incoherent and <laughs> I often feel a bit incoherent for that reason or or insufficiently um, specialized to be able to speak with any authority about anything <laughs> Um, so it is not easy doing interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research, but I think that's the way society is going generally, isn't it? Not, not even within academia, but when you look at the sciences, I mean, they used to say that we had however many senses we had, and now they're discovering that actually we've got more and they're all interlinked anyway. So why did, why did we create these divisions in the first place? So... Yeah, it's it's about having the confidence to move away from old old boxes that, that may be comfortable, but uh, perhaps we should force ourselves into uncomfortable spaces if we can. Um, if you're asking questions, I ask you to turn your mic on. That's the, the black box thing. Um, <laughs> it's a red, it's a red light. Your mic's not on, so uh, the people on Zoom can't hear us when we're asking questions. Um, any other questions? Can I follow up on that one, maybe? Yeah. Which is like more pra sort of practical elements of that. As somebody who also works on what I think might be dismissed by some in the discipline um, as ephemera, um, <laughs> like early 90, late 19th, early 20th century newspapers. Um, what I mean, what's really fascinating about the the material that, that you work with and that I work with, a lot of people work with, um, and but which sits outside the canon, is that it reflects um, not just one culture, but it's reflects several cultures and cultures in dialogue and so on and so forth. Um, and that's incredibly difficult to get across to students or to work with the students. How do you get around that? Because there's that sort of, you know, there's quite often the people who write these things, they don't just have a culture generale, they have culture generale in the plural, they have like, you know, partly a foot in, you know, uh, London, they have a foot in their French public demonstrator and so on and so forth. Um, how do you work with that material with students? And a very practical question, maybe. Um, 
Well, for the reasons we've just discussed, I don't do a lot of work like this with the students um, because, yeah, my I mean, I do the odd guest lecture and things on migration, and uh, but there's no module that I, I sit in. This, I think yeah. there's, a, there's a methodology of working with our students as practitioners. Yeah, I mean, I think at Westminster, we're probably quite privileged in comparison to some institutions in that way because... We have for many years now had cross language modules. Um, so English will be the lingua franca um, and we may have to translate source material, but it means that the students are, are very used to looking at um, artifacts from different cultures and, and looking at them from their own cultural and intercultural perspectives. So we are, yeah, we're quite good at that in, in West, at Westminster partly probably because we don't have huge numbers of students so we're kind of forced to think creatively and ha think how we can make this work within the institution so um yeah we we have very we have a very diverse student body and in the classroom that kind of works in our favor if you like we've got time for one more question but maybe go on long but i suggest we do that um, <laughs> sounds good um, <laughs> um, I don't want to be that person who asks you the question about the stuff you didn't talk about, but <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry, colleagues online. Um, you said that you weren't going to talk about literature, yeah, and you mentioned uh, an absence of um, an absence of the internet in French studies. <laughs> yeah, um, I wondered if 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 you had further thoughts about that, about what sort of whether whether there you see grounds for ex exploring that that kind of pairing of of internet and literature, um, uh, and and or <laughs> why hasn't it been explored? What's 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 stopping uh, research in that area? Um, it has been explored a little bit. Um, but what's stopping it? I don't know what's stopping it. I think people fear taking the risk, getting out of the kind of, as I said, the comfort zone of the, of the literary canon. Um, and, and I think, and I mentioned that in the talk, I think this distinction between content modules and language modules is also a problem. So we tend to think of the internet as, oh, we can use this to listen to something about whatever subject it is and the language people will do that whereas you know the others the area studies or cultural studies people will do something different and better and so it by not looking at the internet they're kind of distinguishing themselves perhaps from the others but I think we as I've said we need to go beyond that and think of ourselves especially in in a time when we're very vulnerable as a, as a discipline um, think of ourselves as a, as a group with shared interests. So, yeah, there's, there's so much out there to be looked at. I mean, I'm just looking at a tiny selection of blogs in my collection, but there is obviously literature which is published only online, and that would definitely be worthwhile doing research on. So, yeah, I would encourage people to do that. And also to make use of the, of the web archive, the collection at the British Library. You may have seen when I showed the slides, some of them said, only available on library premises, which is the case for some of them. And this is to do with legislation. Um, but what you can do if you want to look at an artifact with students and it says only available on library premises is take the URL and then copy and paste that into the internet archive and then you can find it there. So you can use it as a tool uh, to find the archive version somewhere else if you if you can't find it at the British Library um, in the open access version. The, to have open access, I had to get permission from the website owners and not all of them replied. Um, those who did reply tended to, to say yes, but not all of them. Um, businesses tended to be less keen, strangely. Um, so yeah, I'm going off your, your point a bit, but please, please make use of the collection because it's it's there for, for your students to use.
Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm Theresa Fernandes and my colleague Sophie de France from the British Library. And with your permission, we just wanted to plug shamelessly the future appearance of Saskia because uh, we're organising a study day on French collections in UK libraries at the Institut Français on the 20th of November. In which Saskia will be reappearing. <laughs> it won't be the same, honestly. It will be a different talk. <laughs> with, this, is, this, is, this is the USP of our event. Saskia will be paired with our colleague from the uh, UK Web Archive, Nicola Bingham, the lead curator of the UK Web Archive, who worked with Saskia on the collection. And so our idea there is that will be a bit more practical. So Saskia obviously talk about the content, but also how she went about collecting, how she collaborated with Nicola. And any of you here, there was a point yeah, you were interested in sort of building further collections with other communities so this is your chance to come along and, <laughs> and obviously work with uh, Nicola and the UK Web Archive in the way that Saskia pioneered and is still doing but we need more like you. Uh, yeah I mean absolutely it's it's been really great to see how what I've done has kind of had an impact beyond French studies and so now we have a Latin America UK collection, we have a Russia UK collection. Um, one of my PhD students is working on an East and Southeast Asian collection, uh, someone else is working on the Syrian collection so it, it, it's growing and I think it's going to end up being a really rich resource for people working in, in languages and cultures. Any next suggestions? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just making a suggestion that we, we finish now by thanking you last year and then we return to the point. Um, so um, thank, thank you once you. again. Absolutely fascinating um, talk and, and it's got me thinking about lots and lots of things and I'm sure it's got other people. Um, thank um, you for having well. me. Well. So, so thanks again. Thank um, you. <laughs>